I think I'll bring Jean in next, and then when both our speakers have spoken, we'll open it up to the floor for questions and contributions to either or both speakers um, about anything we've raised today. Um, so, without further ado, I'll bring in Jean, who's going to talk about the Grunwick strike, um, which was led by Jaiben Desai, um, who's um, uh, a female migrant worker who took very significant action. Um, go ahead, Jean. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Tessa. Um, this year is the 40th anniversary of the end of the, um, Grun the Grunwick strike, which took place between 1976 and 78. And as Tessa said, it was a strike in which um, ordin very ordinary, un hitherto unorganised and um, predominantly Asian women uh, came out on what is now a really legendary strike over a, over a two-year uh, period. And the strike became a real cause célèbre for the, the labour movement. And during the course of the strike, the strikers effectively took on not just the, the Grunwitz company, but the state, particularly uh, on the receiving end of very vicious tactics from the police and the special patrol group and also the Tories who at that point were um, in opposition led by uh, Margaret Thatcher. Um, a very right wing hitherto unknown organisation called the National Association for Freedom was also involved <coughs> needless to say backing, uh, fully backing the company. Um, the, the heroism and determination of the strikers and also those involved in secondary picketing which I'll explain a bit later on um, was unfortunately as is often the case uh, not matched by the leadership of the trade union congress and also their, their own uh, union uh, apex who were constantly trying to shove the dispute down a more sort of uh, legal ACAS uh, type route. Um, I mean, the reason I'm speaking on this is I've recent, recently, probably probably about six weeks ago, I think, I went to see the uh, Townsend Productions play called We Are the Lions, Mr. Manager, which was certainly on in uh, Nottingham, Mansfield, and Leicester, and, and Leicester yeah, yeah. too. So, you know, I'm sure some of you have actually uh, seen what I found was an absolutely inspirational. Uh, production, particularly the, the performance of um, Madani Patel, who was playing the courageous Jayabin uh, Desai, the, the strike leader, who I think certainly how she was portrayed, and I'm sure in real life, can definitely be described as a, as a liar. <coughs> and for me, it also, it did bring back quite a lot of memories, because I went twice to the Grunwick, uh, the Grunwick picket line, um, in 1977 when I was a student um, and I remember it and I do remember it vividly although that was 41 years ago um, so just to tell you a bit about the strike the strike started um, over the conditions of work in the factory very harsh sort of uh, working conditions in the, in the speed at which employees are expected to work and it developed into a strike over union recognition and the sacking of all those people uh, who went on strike. Grunwick's was, um, was a, based in North London, it was a film processing company and I think the strike really does sum up some of the sort of the high and low points of the of the trade union movement in terms of how determined the strikers were to try and uh, win and like the UCU a lot of their strike took took place in a bitterly cold sort of snowy uh, winters all that determination was not um, not matched by the people who were sort of leading them on a national level the, the owner of the company, he was actually um, an Anglo-Indian and born in, I think, born in New Delhi, was um, George, a man called George Ward, and he received strong support from Margaret Thatcher, who hailed him as a champion of freedom um, in the dispute. You, you, you're probably aware that the strike actually took place under the Callah Jim Callaghan mm. Labour government, which is quite embarrassing for a Labour government, and there was growing um, sympathy for the, for, the, for, the, for the strikers. Um, 
as the press and media do, they, you know, honed in, obviously egged on by the Tories, honed in on particular bits, particularly on the, um, the mass picketing that took place at certain points uh, during the strike, where the picket lines were boosted by, I mean, literally hundreds on, on one day, I think thousands of uh, Yorkshire miners led by Arthur Scargill, um, and the police and the special patrol group really, you know, weighed, waded in with a lot of, you know, a lot of people being injured uh, and so on and being sort of um, trampled on by the, the back end of horses as well. I, I, I remember on one, one of the two occasions I was there, it was pretty scary. Um, so just to give you a bit of background on how the strike started, it, it started in 1976 when a, a male employee was sacked for allegedly uh, working too slowly. The other workers protected, uh, protested they joined the trade union Apex and when around 150 of them went on strike, they were all sacked. So the picketing began in earnest and a, and a two-year strike was underway, led by Jaya Big Desai, who was the first woman um, on the picket line. Most, most of the women strikers, and indeed a lot of the people in the factory, were originally from India and Pakistan and had been settlers. Um, in East Africa when it, when it was under uh, colonial rule and um, just to give a bit of context to that, British imperialism had um, used its sort of divide and rule tactic in East Africa to, to try and ensure that you know, there was division between local people and the, uh, the migrants from um, India, India and Pakistan and they'd sort of um, I suppose promote economically promoted the, the the migrant workers, which caused a lot of division. And then when um, Tanzania, I think it was Kenya and Uganda, gained independence, the, there was a lot of discrimination um, against the Asian migrants. And because they were British citizens, they were able to um, settle in the UK. And, and there was quite a big movement, particularly from Uganda, I seem to remember, um, in 1976. So. Although a lot of these people had quite good jobs um, in East Africa, teachers, nurses, and so on, they, you know, generally, in the context of a certain amount of racism, they ended up largely in low-paid factory work, and that's how some of them ended up working at working at Bromwich. So, first day of the strike, 20th of August, 1976, Jaya Bin Desai walked out in support of her colleague, and as she left. The factory, the manager compared her and her colleagues to, it's quite a racist term really, chattering monkeys. She replied, you know, very eloquently, what you run here is not a factory, it's a zoo. But in a zoo there are many types of animals. Some are monkeys who dance on your fingertips. Other are, others are lions who can bite your head off. We are the lions, Mr. Manager, hence the name of the show. So the strikers joined the trade union Apex, and possibly a union a lot of you have not heard of. Grumwitz refused to recognise the union and sacked all the strikers. The strikers travelled the, the length and the breadth of the country. They had an you know, instinctive understanding of the need to build the strike in terms of uh, solidarity and also the strike hard, hardship fund, as well as standing on the picket lines um, daily. And I think as Sarah sort of alluded to, this dispute um, also helped dispel myths about women and probably you know, stereotypes about um, migrant women being very passive. That was totally dispelled for many during the course of that strike. Um, I mean, the strike wasn't held by the fact that when the, the workers first contacted the TUC about how to join a union, they were directed to this white-collar, very right-wing union um, called Apex. It had one of the most right-wing union uh, leaderships in the, in the TUC at that time, and it was constantly trying to get the strike called off and steered in a sort of uh, arbitration uh, legal route, as opposed to mass striking and solidarity action. But such was the support uh, for the strike, and I'll, I'll, I'll come on to explaining sort of the political and industrial context in a bit. The uh, and the fact that secondary picketing was then still um, lawful. And probably most people do know what secondary picketing is, but just to to explain, secondary secondary picketing is now illegal. It's when either 
you you're on strike and you pick it another workplace that you're not really supposed to pick it or people who have legally nothing to do with the dispute such as the postal workers come and help you pick it so the postal workers are the miners uh, in this case and they were able to organize um, secondary picketing on quite a quite a large scale but nevertheless despite the enormous you know, moral, political and um, trade union support that the strike had, the strike was ultimately uh, defeated and the full force of the state was, had really been put behind the Grunwick bosses to win, to win this, to win this dispute. And the strike had become, the strike, sorry, had become really a national trial of strength between the strikers on the one hand versus the company and the state. Now, the thing that would have, you know, if you say how, how could the strike have been won, it would have been sustained solidarity action because unlike now where everyone probably takes photographs on their phone, <coughs> prints them off on the computer, then the key to the running of this factory was getting in, you know, people take the holiday snaps and so on on a camera, they send the rolls of film off, I'm sure some of you remember doing this, uh, in envelopes to wherever, they, they develop them and they send them back to you. I mean, that probably still happens, I assume, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so key to the, the, obviously central to this company was getting that stuff in and out of the factory and therefore the role of postal workers who was obviously mm -hmm. collecting and delivering uh, was absolutely essential and the postal workers at Cricklewood in North London played a truly heroic role at various points in the dispute in refusing to cross the picket lines to take stuff in and collect uh, stuff as well and that uh, I mean because of the nature of that company that could have to be honest have won the uh, dispute because the company, you know, people would be really cheesed off if they didn't get the holiday snaps and they'd start shopping mm. uh, somewhere else. And ordinary postal workers were prepared to do that over a sustained uh, period, but unfortunately their trade union leaders backed down under the uh, threat of, le of legal area under someone called uh, Lord Scarman. The Apex Union was also trying to wind down the dispute, as I said earlier, trying to come up with a compromise. The strikers would not accept any compromise and in fact in November 1977 four strikers including Jaya Bin Desai went on a hunger strike outside the TUC headquarters protesting about the, the sort of conduct of, of the strike and in response unbelievably Apex their union suspended their strike pay for four weeks. Sounds like sort of thing that Unison too. Um, so in the run-up to the second anniversary of the strike, after this long struggle, the strike committee uh, called off the strike, but they were very, you know, they'd obviously been defeated, but they were very clear, they were not downtrodden, and Mrs. Desai explained how they could have won the strike had they been fully supported by the TUC, particularly in terms of sustained uh, solidarity action. So just to sort of round it off a bit, um, Thatcher cut Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher government came to power in 1979 and one of the first things they did was to outlaw uh, secondary picketing, recognising that that, could have been, that would have been the key factor in winning that and had won previous strikes such as the minor strikes. Um, and I think just to look where, just very briefly before I go backwards, to go forwards to what happened then, I think the, the Grunwick strike and its defeat could also be seen as a bit of a small forerunner about how in the mid-1980s the struggles of the, uh, of the miners in the year-long miners strike and the struggle of Liverpool City Council again in the mid-80s would ultimately be isolated and, uh, and defeated because of the refusal of most parts of the trade union leadership to come in behind those disputes and organise serious um, solidarity action. Just to reflect, then, uh, then I'll finish because I know I've been speaking for 16 minutes. Um, the strike came in the middle of a, a heightened period of militancy and trade union activity. So it followed from the 1972 and 1974 miners' strike, strike building workers, national 
dock strike. And obviously the, the Grunwick strike was about a particular thing, but the mood must have been buoyed up by what was happening generally in, in society. And of course the Tories learnt from that. The Tories saw very clearly the power of the organised trade union movement and they then under Thatcher and, and since and unfortunately the Labour governments then went on to attack it further they set out to consciously break the power of the trade unions um, as I said outlawing secondary picketing and also making illegal things like mass um, uh, voting at mass meetings for strike action obviously that's all now replaced by, by, by secret ballots so I think in conclusion, as, as socialists and probably many of you here are trade union, active in, the tra in your trade union, we, you know, it again shows us we need to draw the conclusion and fight for a political and a trade union leadership that is willing to fight and win and not the role that the majority of the trade union leaders play today, which is to totally accept the limitations mm. of capitalism and therefore mm. essentially play a role really in mediating between the classes. Thank you.